with that, I'm going to start off with uh, the presentation. I mean, uh, if you look at oil and gas industry, there's a, a lot of uh, stages, right? The upstream, midstream, and low stream, right? And a lot of the times when we look at all these activities, it requires a lot of communication. Um, the upstream, downstream, right? The midstream, it all combines of the exploration, the uh, transportation of the oil, and then to a refinery where they kind of uh, do a lot of uh, processing, right? That's where main activities are done. And then of course, once it's done, we store it and then we kind of ship it out to the uh, various uh, location. Now across all these stages, we know of a lot of customers within the uh, region, in the Asia region that kind of uses our radios for their communications. Uh, we do have a lot of activities within countries like Indonesia, right? Where they have a lot of refinery and they've been using our CAMEX systems for the last uh, five years, yeah? And typically, if you look at the equipments that uh, the workers kind of uh, wear, right? A lot of safety gear, uh, starting with the helmets, the eyewear, the, the glasses, um, the vest, the fire retard um, uniform, the safety shoes, and a communication system, right? A radio. And that's part of their day-to-day -day, uh, equipment that they have to bring in. So now, when we talk about all this equipment um, that they bring in, not only the radios, but inclusive of their flashlights, right? Their sensors and all that, it has to kind of conform to the safety requirements as well, the safety regulations. Now, each of these locations would have their own certification of safety level. Now, that's where we kind of come into the big question, right? What is explosion proof, intrinsically safe, has a lot, we hear these terms a lot, right? When we talk about um, equipments within the oil and gas industry or sometimes in the chemical industry. Yeah, we, we hear these terms a lot, but how much do we know? And how do we kind of start to go into this area of understanding, right? So that's the whole intention of this morning, uh, this afternoon, yeah? Now, <clears throat> very briefly, if you look at this uh, page over here, there's a lot of terminologies that perhaps we have come across. For those of you who have been dealing with uh, Motorola for many years, at least for the last 15, 20 years, you will probably be very familiar with the FM approval. FM, yeah, FM standards, FM um, approval. That's where the uh, old GP328, GP338s and all those uh, radios kind of got the approval on, right? And we got it uh, for the intrinsically safe. Now, apart from the FM approval, we do hear a lot of UL, all right, UL being in the markets. Um, and there's another terminology, IEC, IECX, which we hear that a lot as well. So now what is all these names and how do we kind of categorize them? Now, the first steps to approach this is that we want to divide them into two major categories, two major categories, yeah? The first one being the standards driven out within the European standards, the Europe. So that's where the IECX comes in, the ATEX, right? We hear these terms a lot. Now that is a standard driven out of the European um, committee, right? The standards. Now, in the world, there are about two, generally two major standards. Yeah, One is in the Europe and the other one is from the US, Yeah, the American uh, standards. So that's where we see uh, UL, FM, SGS, and a couple of others, right? Playing in that field. So first of all, remember there are two major standards, one in Europe, one in the North America, yeah? Now, I'm just gonna go to the next level first. How do we kind of find out or, or, or determine which of these standards belongs to which um, region or which standards is it, right? Now, the key lookout is the word division and zone, yeah? So if you look at the standards, typically you will see a word DIV, division or zone. Now, this is the first tail sign, right? The first uh, indication for us to kind of have that level of uh, uh, understanding, yeah? If you see the word division, DIV, DIV, right? That is the US version of classification, <clears throat> the US classification. Now, if you see the word zone, that implies the uh, European way of classification. 
Now, what is this division and zone? Ultimately, they are telling us the location of the action. Yeah, it's the location of where the device is being used. It's about the location. Now, just if looking at this chart, um, it kind of tells us the different level of zone or division. So in this picture, <clears throat> we can kind of categorize into three categories. The first category is what we call the area where 100% of the time, the uh, dangerous gas is always there. Yeah, So that's kind of where the uh, storage is typically. So the gas storage on the truck and the underground storage. So those are the first uh, location. 100% of the time, the, the gas is always there. Now, the second part is what we call the uh, intermittent. That means sometimes the gas is there, sometimes the gas will not be there. So that's, uh, for example, in the uh, pumping station, right, in the petrol station, we have the area where the car pull-ups and kind of uh, pumps the car, right, pumps the oil, uh, the petrol. Now, these are the area as we classify as sometimes yes, sometimes no. When there is a car um, pumping, yeah, there is a presence of gas, right? But once the uh, pumping is done, drives off, the gas is no longer there, right? So this is the second classification, the second level, I would say, yeah, the second part. And then the third area is where, by default, if everything goes well, if everything is according to the safety um, level, right, there shouldn't be any gas presence. That's where we call it like the surrounding area, yeah? Now, in these three category, 100%, sometimes, um, by, uh, and the other one is uh, outskirt where we don't have the gas, we call them different zone level or division level. If we were to approach this with the European standard, we will call the storage area as zone zero. Zone one would be the area where intermittent, right? Sometimes there'll be gas, sometimes there won't be gas. And then the surrounding area, zone two. Yeah, zone two means by default, there shouldn't be any gas unless there is a problem. Yeah, there's a leakage or something. That's the zone categorization. Now, if we were to approach this same scenario with the US standards, we will simply call them this as division one, all the way from the storage to the intermittent is also division one, and then the rest of it as division two. <laughs> so if you can see that the uh, European way of classification is actually simpler, yeah? There's only two levels, div one, div two. Whereas if you look at the European standards, it kind of divides further into three levels, the zone zero, zone one, and zone two. So by this itself, we already see the different types of classification between the US and the Europe. Now, one of the message over here I would like to kind of bring up is that we need to kind of <clears throat> comply because they are apple and orange over here. Yeah, they're apple and orange. They are not apple to apple in a way. So if a plant is certified based on ATEX, for example, a zone base, yeah, a zone based classification, then we need to provide the zone base uh, rating certifications, all right? Otherwise, it won't be a kind of like an apple to apple by giving a, a division based kind of a rating, right? So this is the first thing to kind of take note. Now moving from here, <clears throat> this is exactly what I just kind of explained: the difference between um, the location, right? What it means to be div one and zone uh, is based on the amount of um, time that the gas will be available, right? And if you look at the US standards, division one, it kind of overlays or covers zone zero and zone one, yeah? But again, like I mentioned, it's not apple to apple, right? It has kind of equivalent, but not exactly equal. If you look at the history of uh, the standards, uh, we are also seeing some changes in the in in, in the uh, in the industry, right? For example, um, FM being a US division base, they kind of uh, went to harmonize with the IECX kind of uh, standards, right? Um, which explains why in the water table portfolio, 
we migrated from FM to UL, right? Because UL, they have the equivalent kind of standards, um, which they kind of maintain until today, yeah? The uh, UL 913, right? Edition uh, 5, um, it's, kind of, it's kind of still available. And then if we look at the Motorola way of doing things, um, we believe that there's still a market that requires the US kind of classification, the division base, which is why we went to adopt TIA 4950, which kind of based on UL 913-5, yeah? So UL 913 is a kind of a TIA standards division base, right? So they're equivalent. Now I'm gonna go to the next uh, in a while to kind of explain again, the different ways of looking at the standards so to kind of simplify things a little bit more to the next level. So, so far we have uh, kind of covered zone versus division. And this is really talking about the location of the gas. Yeah, keep that in mind. That's the first bullet. Um, now, if we look at some of the uh, portfolio within Model Turbo, I'm just gonna sidetrack a little bit. <laughs> uh, we do have both standards. Right, to be honest, we have both standards available. Um, so if we're talking about the ATEX, the European standard, we have the DP48 series, 44 series, EX, and that's where we kind of comply to the uh, ATEX requirement. Um, now, the next part is that, uh, how do we understand the rating? <laughs> yeah, this is uh, the, the, the part that I think a lot of people kind of uh, look at it and <laughs> struggles a little bit sometimes. So here's the part that we kind of uh, go into it now. First of all, if you look at these standards, normally we will divide them into three, category, three categories. The first one is pertaining to gas. The second one is pertaining to dust, explosive dust, right? And then the third one is about mining, yeah? So if you look at the specs, normally it would cover these three aspects of things. Now, what do I mean by that? Yeah, okay, to look at this, this chart will give us a better idea. Um, let's look at the group. Yeah, the group, the group level. Typically we have a group number, group two, three, right? And typically by having group one and two, right? That speaks about the gas. And then when it's group three, this is where the dust comes in. Yeah, the dust comes in. And then you have an alphabet behind the group. So there's A, B, C, right? Then there's A, B, C again on the group three. Now this A, B, C would then speaks about the type of gas, right? The type of gas. And as the gas progresses, it becomes more and more um, dangerous, right? More and more explosive in a way. So by looking at the rating, for example, if you look at our um, gas rating for our motor turbo radio is 2C. Yeah, we can see the 2C over here. And this 2C is really all the way to hydrogen and acetylene all the way. And then when it comes to the dust, we are 3C. So that's again, all the way to metal dust, which kind of means that we kind of covered most of the ground over here. Yeah. Then of course, the last section is really to do with the temperature. Now, this is also a bit tricky, yeah? <laughs> um, on the first glance, typically when we look at numbers and specs, higher is always better, right? But in this case, it's the other way around. <laughs> the higher the temperature is not so good, yeah? It, it, it's, it's, it's getting worse. What it means by this temperature is that if we use the device, how hot or how high will the temperature be the, the, the device will reach the temperature that the device will reach so obviously the lower the temperature <clears throat> is safer for the environment right the lower the temperature it becomes safer for the environment so in our case we are t4 so t4 we are 135 celsius this is the highest that the the, the device will get at any any point of time yeah so of course, the lower it is, the safer it gets. Okay, so for our radio, we are 2C, T4. So 2C, we're covering all the hydrogen acetylene gas, and then T4, which is 
135 Celsius. So we are good to that level of uh, protection. Yeah, that's what it means. So hopefully by now we kind of dive a little bit into the specs to kind of look at the rating and kind of figure out some of these uh, uh, facts. Yeah. Now, apart from that, I think uh, if you look at the radio, just to promote a little bit, right? If you're not familiar, this is a device that has the compliance to the ATEX certification and it has uh, built-in Bluetooth, right? The display looks very much like a DP um, standard, yeah, 48, but uh, except that you can notice the blue housing. Now, coming to the US standards, um, we have another suite of radios. Uh, we are all very familiar well, with the new R7, the ION, the DP48 series. Uh, all this has the uh, DIA approval, right? DIA 4950. Now, I'm going to break that down in a moment as well. Again, if we look at the ratings, right, the ratings, it would follow the same kind of approach. Now, in this case, we are not looking at group, but rather the uh, Okay, the, the, the class, yeah. So class speaks about, again, the gas, and then class two would be the, the dust. And then class three is, again, uh, some of the uh, dust as well, yeah, particles and all that. Typically, it's, uh, the, uh, it's not so key for this, yeah. Now, again, just now we talk about division. Division is based on the location, yeah, the, the, the situation. Um, is there the gases all the time? Is there dust all the time? So that's the div one, div two. So remember class, going back to class, that's the type of gas for class one. Class two is the dust. And then class three are some of the airborne fibers. Now coming into the chart again, yeah? So if we look at this, uh, our radio today, we are yeah, class one group C and D. So again, here we have class one, which are all the gases. We have compliance on C and D, which is ether and hydrocarbons, which means this radio cannot be used for hydrogen and acetylene. Yeah, so that's the limit over here. We see it doesn't have class. It doesn't have a class one A and B. It doesn't include, it's only C and D. So this is where it stands. Now, when it comes to class two, there we see group E, F, G. Class two, group E, F, G. So what does E, F, G stands for over here? Metal dust, carbon uh, dust, and then G is the flour and grains and all those type of uh, dust. So for dust, we are covered, yeah? Now, um, just a, a bit of trivia, <laughs> um, flour, is actually explosive if it's in the air. So if you're in the uh, kitchen baking a lot of uh, flour flying, <laughs> be careful not to light a uh, spark, right? It may explode. <laughs> so flour, yeah, I, I kind of learned this along the way as well. I didn't know that. <laughs> so this is the dust. And then airborne particles would be like um, wood, debris, textile. So if you're in the workshop of uh, the, 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 the um, wooden wood, woodwork, so this could be potentially um, explosive as well, yeah, to a certain level. And then when we look at class, uh, division two, yeah, div two. Div two means area that typically don't have a gas, but it may occur when there is a problem or something like that, yeah. So class one, then we have A, B, C, D covered for the gas, yeah. So div two, we are fine, but div one, no, we are up to C and D. All right, so hopefully that gives us a better bearing of uh, what all this is talking about. Now, this chart kind of help us to digest a little bit more. Um, the fact that this chart was taken off based on our migration previously from FM to UL, um, there was a change in the label. If you notice that, right, it used to be a green label and then became a white label with the UL logo. Now, what, I try, what, what I'm trying to bring across for this chart is that there are three, <clears throat> three levels of, um, I would say, parameters. Yeah, three different parameters. And which one should we be uh, extra careful in a way? Now, when we talk about all these ratings and standards, 
there are three parameters. The first one being the lab that certifies the approval or the, 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 the standards. Yeah. So in the world, there are a couple of major labs. Um, I'll I call them companies. Yeah. These are companies that run the uh, testing. So we have FM. Yeah. That's one of the uh, major uh, company. You have UL, Underwriters Labs. And then, of course, there are SGS and all that in the market. Yeah, SGS, perhaps you guys have heard of it from a Vertex portfolio previously, <laughs> right? And these are all the labs. They are just a house, a testing house. That's it, right? Now, the next one is we are talking about the standards. What standards are we complying to, right? Because standards are the one that kind of capture the test method, right? What is the uh, failure rate? what is the safety design, it goes to the level of rules, right? So we are talking about all the rules of uh, how it, it take, what it takes to get there. So that is the standard. Now, again, in the world, there are a bunch of standards. We used to have FM 361088, 88 is for the year 88, right? Um, this kind of went off, it went to IECX kind of level. And then there is TIA 4950. Right. TIA is again um, the, the, the committee in the US. Uh, they, they kind of came off with the uh, P25 standards as well, if you just a trivia. Yeah. So P25 standards is also under TIA. So TIA 4950 is meant for the HESLOC, hazardous and uh, location. Right. And then, of course, we do have UL 913 as well. So when we hear UL 913, that is another standards. And of course, this standards has its own addition, yeah, addition five, six, seven, and whatever, right? Because the addition kind of changes a little bit about the specs as it goes. So we need to be careful of the addition as well. Now, the most important part of all is really the rating itself. So the rating itself. So rating is what we have been covering, the division one, the class with the groups of guests, and then the class two, the dust, what kind of dust uh, type, the group EFG, and then of course class three, and then the temperature. Yeah. So rating is the part that is universal across all. Rating is the one that kind of ties in all the different test house, the different standards, as long as it all complies to the rating. So if uh, someone needs uh, Division 1, Class 1, Group CD, we can always offer them either TIA radio or FM radio as long as it complies to the rating, right? So this is something that we will have to take note of uh, because end of the day, different manufacturers may go for different test house. It can be SGS, it can be UL. They may comply to different standards per se, TIA for the 950 or UL 913, it's fine, yeah? As long as the rating is based on what the customer requirement is, right? As long as it meets the customer's rating requirement. Now, what, how, what, what's the rules of engagement, right? So typically when we sell um, Haslock radios, we do not recommend, right? We, we do not recommend to the customers to say, hey, you must use this radio or use this radio. But rather the approach is that we have a radio that has this rating, Mr. Customer, is this something that you can accept? Is this something that is safe for your usage? So that should be the approach. Because end of the day, in every customer, um, I would say the, the operations, there will be a safety officer. And that's, that person, the safety officer, would be the person to kind of uh, dictate what level of safety is required for the plan. Yeah, what, 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 what's the requirement? What's the rating that is required? So again, they have to tell us if this uh, level of uh, safety, is it enough for them? Yeah, is it sufficient for them? So that's how the approach is, yeah? Of course, then if you look at the uh, past FM and the current TIA 4950, they hold the same classification, which kind of explains why 
um, the customers in the past using GP328 FM, they can continue to buy the DP4800 E DIA approved radios. Yeah, it's the similar thing. Now, speaking about all these things, right? It wouldn't be complete by not uh, kind of uh, introducing some of our feature sets as well, some of our uh, more notable advancement in terms of features to kind of enhance performance and safety as well, right? So if you look at uh, these slides over here, these are some of the features that we offer, uh, which is kind of a uh, uh, common, right? We talk about noise cancellation, we talk about intelligent audio, we talk about um, the feedback suppressors. I mean, we, we can kind of say that oh, all these radios complies to the standard, but if the audio performance is not good, <laughs> it kind of defeats the whole purpose, right? Because then we won't be able to get the right message across. That itself could create hazard <laughs> in the workplace, right? Uh, of course, there are more features. Uh, we are talking about uh, text to speech, right? Just to make sure that the text gets to the uh, people with the message, with the uh, content that they can always refer to, they can remember. Um, we can have a uh, tracking functionality, indoors, outdoors tracking to kind of enhance the safety, yeah? To make sure that we account for all the uh, workers. Now, of course, we do have dedicated suites of uh, features that is meant for safety, digital emergency, the search tone. When you hit the emergency, you have a tone coming out from the radio so that if anybody needs to rescue the person, they can always hear for the tone and go forward based on the sound. Um, man down. Uh, we all know very well that uh, for people who are working alone, this is critical. If they get uh, knocked down, the radio will detect and kind of sense the uh, emergency. Same goes with loan worker, where it detects the uh, activity level of the user. Um, a little bit about the, um, the, the system. Again, we have all the different suites for our oil and gas customers, depending on the needs. A lot of our in Indonesia, let's say we share from Indonesia, um, they kind of use different types of system for their different operations. For example, for all the refineries, they would go for a CapMax, yeah? Typically, one refinery, they have about 1,000 to 2,000 users within a plant. Um, for the uh, midstream, where they do a lot of uh, distribution, right? A lot of uh, pumping, uh, gas pumping stations and all that, they would go for capacity plus, something that is more um, affordable for them in a way. Uh, they just need to communicate between the uh, different stations. So that's the capacity plus. So as we reach to this point, we are almost uh, coming to the end of the presentation. Just a quick summary. If we look at the portfolio, again, remember the two major classification, the European standards versus the US standards. The European standards will use the term as a zone. The US standards will use the term as division. So over here, we are looking at the division base, um, div one and the class. And then we have all the different uh, classification. So with the charts, it kind of helps us to navigate a little bit better to kind of understand which are the gas groups that is compliant. And then of course, as I mentioned, it is tested to the TIA 4950. So what is TIA 4950 again? It is the standard. <laughs> and of course, this standard is owned by TIA, which is a uh, committee within the US, tested in the UL laboratories, which is explained why our label has the UL logo. Our certification has the UL logo. It's a test house, <laughs> right? So, but most important is the rating itself. Yeah, this is the critical part, which we always need to communicate with our end users. And then, of course, not forgetting <laughs> ATEX being one of the uh, uh, important one as well. Again, we have the rating for the gas, the dust, the mining, and um, it has the certification from the ATEX, right? So ATEX again is a is a is a test house that given us the approval. And the last part, um, don't forget, <laughs> we have all our accessories. 
Now, this is also important because accessory carries the same level of importance in the certification. So if we were to use FM or UL TIA 4950 radio, but if let's say the RSM is not approved, it defeats the whole purpose. Yeah, it becomes the uh, the failing point. It is is the non-compliance on the uh, accessory. So when we pick an accessory, we want to make sure that it matches the rating on the radio as well. And a, a question that people always ask as well: Can I mix a tax accessory with a TIA radio? The answer is no. <laughs> yeah, the answer is no because they are certified differently, and they would they would not be compliant if we cannot. Um, mix them yeah so it's very important when we look at the uh, brochure the accessory brochure we need to look at the right uh, ratings based on the radios that we are using so to make sure that it's all tested and certified based on the correct uh, portfolio yeah 